You know how I always begin when I come back from abroad. <laughs> the Hindi saying, Sare Jahan Se Acha as CFC Hamara. The best place is CFC. There's no place like home. So being absent from here, only in spirit, only in body, but not in spirit, it means being a blessing to a lot of other people in many other countries. See, God has planted CFC churches now in about 12 countries. It's not our work, it's God's work. And many of them need encouragement, guidance. And uh, here, I have been here with you longer than with any other church in the world. So I'm happy to spend more time in other places. And what is, interestingly, what is laid in my heart this morning is very similar to the command we had for memory today. Whoever wants to be first among you must be last. We must never forget that. It's easy to remember that when we begin our Christian life. And uh, when we look at the history of Many churches, they did not bear that in mind. You've heard me say this many times. It's easy for God to bless anybody. For that man to remain humble after God has blessed him, it's very rare and very difficult. And God has blessed CFC through the years it's only those who have been here from the beginning and in a sense, I think more than anybody else, only Ian knows here exactly how it was for us in the early days, how we were despised and rejected by all Christians. And we said, fine, that's the way Jesus went, so we'll go that way. And in a sense, we were safe in those days because we were outside the camp, despised, rejected. We had only God. But today, we are in danger because we have the acclaim and approval of many people who respect CFC. Our internet messages go to about 100 countries, nearly. And we get responses from all those people. They all know about CFC. We are in great danger. And many of you have also prospered financially. And that is another cause of danger. I'm not saying it's wrong to earn money. With the cost of living going up, it's right that we look for jobs with a good pay and get an increase in salary. That's all OK. But along with money, Often, if you look around among worldly people and Christians, pride comes in. There's nothing wrong with a good salary. There's nothing wrong in living a good house. There's everything wrong in being proud of it. When we started CFC, only I had a scooter. And that was because I, was, I had it from the Navy days. Nobody else had anything more than a cycle. People used to come to the church meeting by bus or by cycle. We were safe. I'm not saying poverty brings protection, but it's a little safer. But now, look at the number of people who have so much wealth and cars and we need parking lots. Nothing wrong in that again. The danger is if it makes you proud. You can own a private jet airplane for yourself and not be proud. But you can ride a bicycle and be proud. It's not the vehicle. It's not the salary. It's not all that poor people are humble. There are multitudes of poor people in India, and they are not humble. And there are many godly rich people I have met who are extremely humble. So all I'm saying is we've got to be careful about sitting back and saying, oh, God has blessed us. And people appreciate us. <clears throat> and that's the thing that we have to be aware of. 
I want to begin with a verse in 1 Peter and chapter. <clears throat> See, the reason I mention is because if you study church history, I've studied church history of the denominations that started well and where they are today. All of them, even denominations that started in the 20th century, have gone down and lost the grace of God. And many others from the time of the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. Many, many, many groups have come up who came out of other groups because they said those groups compromised the word of God. They're not preaching the whole counsel of God. They came out. And that was good. But over a period of time, this group also declined. And some group came out of that. And that was good. But they group, that group also declined. This has been the history of the Christian church, particularly in the last 500 years. Some group comes out of the great zeal for purity, to stand for the truth. And there are godly men whom God has raised up to lead this new group in that direction. But after a while, usually after about 40, 50 years, decline sets in. Sometimes, it's a good group, maybe 60, 70 years, decline sets in. And the reason is, very often, they become, almost invariably, they become proud. We are the ones whom God has chosen in our generation to proclaim the whole counsel of God. Aha. Uh -huh. Beware of thinking like that. I often say to myself, God's work went on wonderfully before I was born. And it will continue wonderfully after I'm gone. For a short period, you and I are here on this earth. Let us do what we can in humility and brokenness. Thankful that God gives us the privilege of doing a little bit for his kingdom. And never ever imagining that we are somebody. We are nobodies, all of us. 1 Peter chapter 5. I don't know whether you've noticed the connection here. Sometimes we read scripture and the Holy Spirit puts certain verses together next to each other and we will see the connection. Here is one of those passages like that. 1 Peter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Therefore, why? Because in the previous verse it says, in the last part, clothe yourself with humility towards one another because, what is the reason? God will oppose you if you are proud. It's terrible to have, my flesh opposes me, the devil opposes me, there are ungodly people who oppose me, there are even Christians who oppose us. On top of all that, if God himself opposes you, not just the devil, God himself opposes you, there's no hope for any of us. And it says here, God is opposed to the proud. There's one group of people that the Bible specifically says God opposes. We would think he opposes the ungodly. Some ungodly people are humble and broken like the repentant adulteress whom Jesus forgave, like the repentant murderer on the cross whom Jesus forgave. But the proud, like the other thief on the other side of the cross, both were murderers. One was proud, the other was humble. That's why one went to hell, the other went to heaven. That's the only reason. It's not because one lived a better life. It was humility that made the difference in the two thieves on the cross. It was pride that made the difference. God is opposed to the proud. Whether it's a person, whether it's a family, whether it's a church, whether it's a preacher, whether it's anybody, apostle, prophet, whatever. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you ask God for grace, you'll get it only if you're humble. When you ask God for the, the spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit is called the spirit of grace. And he's pictured in the Bible like a river of water. And you know that water always flows to the lowest place first. 
the humblest person sitting here will be the first among us to receive God's power if God pours out his spirit, I assure you. Because the water always flows to the lowest place first. And it's not a weather question, you think you're humble or I think I'm humble. It's a question of whether God sees that you are humble. You don't even have to pray for grace. If a river is flowing, you don't have to pray that the river will come to the lowest place. It will automatically come. Pursue humility, dear brothers and sisters. And then what will happen is, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you. Exalt you does not mean that you'll become rich. It does not mean that you'll become a great spiritual leader. It does not mean that you'll become famous in the Christian world or in the regular world, in the rest of the world. It, will, it means he will exalt you over sin. What do you want to be exalted over? Over people? I hope not. Do you want to be exalted to be a great famous Christian? I hope not. I tell you the passion of my heart for more than 40 years has been I want to be exalted over all sin in my life. And by sin I mean anything that is unlike Jesus Christ in my life. In my behavior, in my conversation, in my attitude to people, in my attitude to money, in my service for God, anything, anything unlike Christ, I want to be exalted over it. I hope you have understood this verse like that. That's how I understand it. God will exalt you at the right time. What is the right time? The time when he sees that you don't become proud over your victory. I remember, I mean, I sought the Lord, I sought the Lord for victory for many, many years. And I knew that was the right time. And the right time was after God had broken me and humbled me through repeated failures for a long time so that I would never lift up my head to think that I got victory by myself. So that I would never lift up my head and look down on another poor sinner or backslider as though I'm better than him. God waited until that time. He had to wait until he was sure that I will not lift up my head and look down on a backslider or look down on some sinner thinking that I deserve salvation more than him. That is the proper time. And that's why God is not able to exalt some of you, my dear brothers and sisters. I love you and that's why I tell you the truth. God longs to give you victory, but there's a proper time. Already, even though you don't have victory, some of you are already proud that you're better than somebody here for some reason or the other. Maybe you know the Bible better. Maybe you're a leader of some house group. Maybe your, your messages, or you preach a little better than somebody else. Maybe you can play a musical instrument better than others. God will oppose you till the end of your life. He'll oppose you and destroy you. Whatever you're proud of, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That's what it says here. It's a mighty hand. Imagine the almighty God, hand of God, cannot humble you. What a proud person you must be. And what is the mark that you have humbled yourself? Here it is. God gives grace to the humble. And how do you know you got grace? You know, the verse we have preached for 45 years. Sin shall not rule over you when you are under grace. All these 45 years, whenever I've slipped up, even slightly, in my thoughts or with a rude word, I said, Lord, why did that happen? It wasn't some gross sin, some small slip up. Why did that happen? And God says, you did not get grace. Because if you had grace, you would not have slipped up. You would not have spoken that angry word. You would not have done that wrong thing. You would not have got upset with your husband or your wife. You did not get grace at that moment. And then I say, Lord, why didn't I get grace? Lord says, because you were proud. 
I give my grace only to the humble. So I learned that many years ago that whenever I'm defeated by sin, even the slightest, supposing I find a thought I cannot conquer. Why? Only one reason, pride. You continue to get irritated with your wife, irritated with your husband. Only one reason. My brother, sister, don't, don't say she is bad or he is bad. That is not the reason. Jesus was surrounded by the most evil people in the world, yet he never sinned. Don't say, I've got a wicked wife or a bad husband. No, you are proud. And you did not get grace. That's the only reason you got upset and irritated and lost your temper. At least remember that from today onwards. So that at least you can find a solution for it by going to God and saying, Lord, tell me, how can I get grace? And so whenever the Lord said to me, it's because you were proud you didn't get grace, and because you didn't get grace you slipped up there, the next question I asked the Lord was, Lord, show me where I am proud. And sometimes the Lord would show me something that happened the previous week where... God blessed me in some way and I was not quick to give the glory to God. I felt a little spiritual pride. I'm ashamed of it. But that's happened so often in the past that now I'm very quick to immediately not touch the glory of God. Do you know when you take credit for something that God did through you, you're touching the glory of God. You're touching something that's holy. And if, if you did that in the old covenant, you'd be smitten dead immediately. Uzzah once touched the ark of God. He just touched it. And he was smitten to death. Thank God we are under the new covenant. Have you touched the glory of God somewhere? Have you taken credit for your well-behaved children? God have mercy on you. Have you taken credit for the way you have prospered in your work or grown spiritually? God have mercy on you. You look down on others thinking that you're better than them instead of recognizing that it is God's mercy that's made you what you are. Humble yourself, my brother. And don't think that God cannot help you in tough situations, difficult situations. It says in verse 7, cast your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. I love that. God is not only opposed to the proud, he op gives grace and he cares for you. I love that verse. Oh, Father, you care for me. You care for me. So I don't want to grab anything I don't want to fight with anybody for anything. I will not wrestle with flesh and blood for anything. We've had a couple of examples in our CFC churches of people who left CFC in some other parts of India and walked away with the church building which was financed with CFC money. I said, take it. I will not fight with flesh and blood for anything. I am too busy fighting with Satan and evil forces. I have no time to come down to the level of fighting with human beings over silly things like property. Take it. Maybe you don't have that attitude and that's why you're struggling with sin because that property is more important for you than victory over sin. No property on earth or church property or my property is more important to me than living a pure Christ-like life. You take that attitude and I tell you, you will come to victory very quickly. Your home life will be transformed, your children will follow the Lord. So many wonderful things will happen in your life, which you're missing all, this, all, this, all these years because you're seeking the wrong things first. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Never forget this verse, my brothers, I don't care who you are, he cares for you. And if God cares for me, why do I have to worry? I don't have to worry about anything. People cannot take a hair from my head, cannot touch a hair on my head without God's permission. He cares for us. That's why we have no anxiety. And then, this is the connection I wanted you to see. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God 
because God gives grace to the humble. Because, verse 8, be sober in this area. That means be very serious about this. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. How do you understand that verse? You think it's persecution? Let me tell you something. It says the devil seeking to someone to devour. He has never in these 2,000 years devoured any Christian by persecution. Never. Persecution purifies the church. Persecution purifies Christians. He devours people by pride. That's what that verse is referring to. That's why it is written in the context of humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Verse 6, why should you humble yourself? Because the devil, who became the devil through pride, is like a roaring lion. His roar is the roar of pride. And he is seeking to swallow as many people as possible, not only in the world, but even among believers, and even in CFC, through pride. So be alert. Be sober. I don't want to say that Oh, I preserved myself so long, so I'll be all right. No. It is God who preserves me, but I have a responsibility to be of sober spirit. That means to be serious and not to think that, oh, I'm beyond, now it's gone well with me for so long, so it'll go well with me forever. Then I'm in danger. I want to have a sober spirit which says, I want to be alert all the time against this roaring lion who's roaring and rooming around and he's roaming around CFC churches and I'll tell you a number of cases I have seen in the last 45 years elder brothers who have fallen devoured by Satan not by persecution by pride they prospered financially after falling away and you know what they say ah see we stood against CFC and God has prospered us financially uh -huh. <laughs> just look around the world and see who are the people prospering financially today in other religions and you'll see whether it is a blessing of God or something else don't ever think that financial prosperity is the blessing of God God gives us more than enough of what we need but that is not the primary blessing of God that is the bonus he throws in you know like you work in a company, not for bonus. You work in a company for a salary. The bonus is thrown in extra. Whether you get it or don't get it, you work for your salary. And the salary God gives us is victory over sin. The bonus is a little financial blessing or prosperity. Always look at that as a bonus and not a salary. None of you will work in a company just to get a bonus. You work for a salary. I want my salary, overcoming sin. And if the bonus is thrown in of financial prosperity, I accept it. If not, it's quite okay. But that's not what I live for. So, I was thinking of this in relation to, you know, the Old Testament is written as an example. I want you to see a verse in 1 Corinthians 10, which says about Old Testament, the, why is three quarters of the Bible Old Testament? We live under the New Covenant, but yet three quarters of the Bible is Old Testament stories and many things like that. And there's a reason. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6 says, I believe this refers to the entire Old Testament. The things that happen there are examples for us. That we should not crave for those evil things as they also craved. Of course, it's referring to the people in the wilderness who disobeyed God, but I can say it refers to all those people in the Old Testament who made a mistake of seeking something. So, I want to give you a few examples. As I was studying this subject, I found there are many more examples, but I'll give you ten examples of people who missed out on what God had for them because of pride. A warning for us. And the first example, sometimes we don't think of it, is Eve. 
Eve disobeyed. But what was the reason for her disobedience? The devil told Eve, look at this lovely fruit. Genesis 3. You know why God doesn't want you to eat it? Because he knows Genesis 3 verse 5. You will be like him. And he doesn't want you to be like him. He wants to be alone, God. You will become like him. And God is scared that you will become like him. So he doesn't allow you to eat it. Can you, can you imagine how stupid he was? Created perfect. She became stupid because she thought, thought that God did not love her. And where do you see pride there? The pride is feeling, I know better than God. I know God has told me don't eat this, but I know better. I'll eat it. Every time you commit a sin, which God says don't do, you're manifesting the same pride. I know better than God. You make a false statement in your office to make a little more money. Okay, you make a little more money. But you know it's unrighteous. You know it's a lie. And you think God will bless you in spite of that lie and you think I know better than God. And that's why you suffer. See, this is how Satan himself became the devil. He was the highest of the angels. Given authority over everything. And he said, I want to be like God. Pride. I want to be like God. I want to be up above there. You read that in Isaiah 14. That's how he fell. And the same infection he gave to Eve. First Genesis 3, 5. You will be like God. That's, that is what he had in his heart and how he became the devil. Did he tell Eve, that's how I became the devil, by the way? No. And when you puff yourself up about anything, does the devil, devil remind you, remember, that's how I became the devil? Will he tell you that when you're getting puffed up? No. He doesn't want you to imagine that you're puffing yourself up and losing the grace of God. He doesn't want you to know that that's how the devil became the devil. He doesn't want you to know that he's coming as a roaring lion to you at that moment. What does Peter say? Be alert. Every moment, be sober. Don't play the fool with Christianity. Be alert. So that's the first example. And then we move to another example, and that is some small, some big. And that is Noah. You know, after God has blessed us, I told you, it's easy for God to bless somebody. But to remain in humble after God has blessed us, it's a difficult. You know the story of Noah, I don't have to tell you. He was the one man, one single man, who saved this earth from destruction. All of us are here because of Noah. If Noah was unfaithful, there was no one on earth that was faithful. This world would have been destroyed. You and I would not have been born. That's why I'm eager to meet Noah when I get to heaven and say, Brother, thank you so much. Because of you, I'm in heaven. Otherwise, I wouldn't even have been born. Because God found one man to be faithful. It's an interesting thing that we see in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament and in church history. Very often, God does his work through one man. Half the New Testament would not have been written if Paul was not there. One man. One man. It was like that in Jeremiah's time. One man who stood up for God. It was like that in Noah's time. And then when he comes out of the ark, can you imagine how he must have felt, wow, because of me, my family is saved. I am somebody. God has blessed me. Now see Genesis 9. And God blessed Noah, verse 1. And verse 20, Noah began farming and planted a vineyard and drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Is it God's will for a man to drink a little wine, it's okay, but to get drunk and to strip your clothes and 
lie down naked in an open tent? Is that a man of God? How did it happen? I believe it was pride. See who I am, see what God's done through me. And it doesn't matter whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. It may be written only in the New Testament. But God has always been the same. He resists the proud. It's not that suddenly he started resisting the proud in the New Testament. He always resisted the proud. Even if it is his favorite servant Noah. That's the thing we have to remember. I mean, I would be ashamed if I get drunk and lie naked somewhere. It would mean that what, Lord, what happened? I lost grace from you somewhere. Wouldn't you be ashamed? It's really amazing. Warning. These things are written for us as a warning. The next example I would mention is Abraham. Turn with me to Genesis 12 and see what God told Abraham. Verse 2, Genesis 12, 2. I'll make you a great nation. And the last part of verse 3, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. Imagine if God said that to you. I sometimes read the scripture and I put myself in that person's place. It's a good thing to do. How would I have felt if God Almighty came to me among all the millions of people on the earth and say, I'm going to bless every family on the earth through you. Oh. I'd have to be really watchful that I remain broken and humble before God. And because, and God said, I'm going to, through your seed, and remember, Abraham and Sarah had no children. And we read that it made him a little proud. And that's why later on you read that uh, he went to Egypt without consulting God. God had told him, stay in Canaan. No, he said, no, I think I can go to Egypt. There's no food here. I'll go to Canaan. See, it's a small little step. God had told him, you go to the land I will show you. And you be there. Genesis 3, 12, 7. I'll, did, I'll give you this land. But when he went there, it says in verse 10, there was a famine in the land. And that's what happens often when we obey God, we run into problems. You get into Jesus and cross the lake at Jesus' command and there's a storm. But the storm does not mean that you've disobeyed God. No. The famine does not mean you've disobeyed God. You went where God told you to go and if there's a storm or a famine, you stay there. God told me to be here. Did he consult God? No. I'll go to Egypt. Hey, Abraham, God's told you to be here in Canaan. No, no, no. There's no food here. I better go to Egypt. And you know what happened in Egypt? One big mistake. He saw that all the Egyptians have got maid servants to help their wives. So he decided to get a maid servant from Egypt called Hagar. And you know the story. How... He got a son through Hagar, which was the cause of problems and problems and problems. Even though God had told him, I will give you a son through Sarah. When he didn't get a son for a long time, he thought, I've got to help God. Genesis 16, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had no children. So they had this Egyptian maid called Hagar, Genesis 16.1. Where did Hagar come from? He would, she would never have come into Abraham's house if he, Abraham had not gone to Egypt. See how one little wrong step leads to umpteen problems that caused problems for Abraham and his children for centuries. One little wrong step without consulting God. God tells you to go here and you have a little problem there. So you go somewhere else. And then Sarah said, see, I don't have any children. We've got to help God a little bit, you know. And Abraham listened to his wife, foolishly. And he got a son. It was the pride, I believe that 
There was a pride that I am the chosen one and I can do what I like. That very often happens like that. Okay, let me give you another example. That's Jacob. And you know the story of Jacob. These are examples written for our instruction. Abraham was proud. I am chosen one. It says about Jacob in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 23 when his wife Rebecca was expecting twins. The Lord said to Rebecca and also to Isaac at that time, Genesis 25, verse 23, it's not just two children in your womb, there are two nations in your womb. One is the nation of Israel and another nation. One will come through Jacob, the other will come through Esau. But, the last part of verse 23, the older Esau will serve the younger. Jacob will be the leader, even though he's the younger twin. And yet, Jacob knew that. And yet, when the time came when Isaac said, I don't want to go into all those details, you read that in Genesis 27, I will bless you. He called Esau and said, Isaac, knew that God had said, the younger one has to be blessed, but the Bible says that Isaac loved the deer meat called venison, deer meat so much that, he says, forget about what God said, I love meat that Esau can cook and bring, I'll bless you Esau. And Jacob, Rebecca heard it and told Jacob, hey listen, your father's going to bless Esau today as soon as he brings the meat. Jacob could have said, I don't have to help God. My grandfather, Abraham, tried to help God and you know what happened. Ishmael was born. I don't have to help God. God can, if God has said, I'm going to get the blessing, I'll get it. I don't have to fight for it. But he never said that. He listened to his mother. You know the number of believers who listen to their mother more than they listen to God? I have met numerous people like that. They listen to their parents and want to God. There are some of you sitting here, I know, who have listened to your parents more than you listen to God. Learn a lesson from what happened to Jacob. His mother said, I want to get you God's blessing. Really? Listen to God and not to your mother if she leads you in some other direction. Honor God. And if Jacob could have said, Mom, God's told me I'll get the blessing. I can trust him. I don't have to try these secret techniques of pretending to be Esau and telling lies. No. And because he cheated, he had to run away. And see how God finally dealt with him. Genesis 32. God did not forsake Jacob, even though he deceived and told, didn't trust him. <clears throat> One day when Jacob was alone, Genesis 32, 24, Jacob was left alone. You know the reason why God does not meet with some of you? I'll tell you. Because you never take time to be alone with God. You like to meet God in the meeting here, in the crowd of other people. Yeah, there's a blessing here, definitely. But there are personal encounters that we need to have with God that you can have only when you are alone. Jacob was left alone. That's the time God met with him. And it says here, God wrestled, and it says a man wrestled with him. Because God was trying to teach him for 20 years and more, I've been trying to wrestle with you, to humble you, break you, to stop trusting in yourself and to trust me. But he did not succeed. And then we read that God dislocated Jacob's thigh, verse 25. And after that he had to limp he was a young man by the standards of those days when people lived up to 150 years and all. A young man and from that day onwards he had to walk with a cane. When, if you see a 25 year old young man walking with a cane, if some of you are 25, if you have to come walking with a cane to the church every Sunday, how will you feel? It's pretty humiliating. It's alright for people who are 60 or 70 but 
25-year-old young man walking with a cane because his, his hip socket was dislocated by God. And that's when God told him, Now I have broken you, Jacob. Now onwards, verse 28, you will be called Israel. Because you have prevailed. It's very interesting. The only time, the time rather, the time that God could tell Israel, Jacob, you have become an Israel, is when he broke him. It was that pride in Jacob. He thought he was very smart. He could deceive his father-in-law, Laban, and all that. God broke him. And when you turn to the New Testament, you see this wonderful verse. I'm, some of you already know it, but let me mention it to those who don't know. Hebrews 11. It's an amazing verse. You know that Hebrews 11 is the chapter of amazing miracles. Abraham had a son as an old man. Samson his mighty power manifested and he killed lions. Jericho, the, Joshua pulled down the walls of Jericho. Moses split the Red Sea. All these things are mentioned in this. And people were raised from the dead. It says here in verse 35. But in the midst of all these miracles, fantastic miracles, it's written about Jacob. What is his miracle? Hebrews 11:21. He leaned on the top of his staff. That's his miracle. He's walking with a cane. You say, what, what sort of a miracle is that to come in Hebrews 11? <laughs> I think it is the greatest miracle in Hebrews 11. That God succeeded in breaking a proud man to teach him, like you're leaning upon this cane, Jacob, lean upon me for the rest of your life. And so he had revelation which his father Isaac did not have. It's a very interesting story. When Isaac wanted to bless, he was blind. That's how Jacob could fool him. And he gives the blessing to the wrong person. Isaac gives the blessing to the wrong person because he's blind. You know, it says in Genesis, towards the end of Genesis, that Jacob was also blind. When Joseph brought his two children, elder son Manasseh, younger son Ephraim, to Jacob, and he made sure that, you know, the right hand is the hand of blessing, so he brought Manasseh towards Jacob's right hand and Ephraim towards Jacob's left hand and said, I mean, my father's blind, let me bring him there. And you know what Jacob did? He crossed his hands. And, and Joseph said, no, 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 no. And the wonderful words of Jacob, you read that in Genesis. My son, I know. I know. That's what a man of God says. I know. I know things you don't know. This younger boy is going to be blessed. And you read the rest of the Old Testament, Ephraim was blessed more than Manasseh. Where did Jacob get such a revelation? Because he had learned to lean upon his staff. He had learned to lean upon God. He was not the proud man he was in his younger days. And if God can bring you and me to that place where all our life will say, till the end of my life, Lord, I will lean upon you. You will get revelation too. God will show you amazing things in scripture that other people can never teach you. Let me now show you the example of Moses in Numbers. The proud Jacob and the humble Jacob. What a difference. In Numbers, it says something about Moses. Amazing word. In Numbers chapter 12. Verse 3. The man Moses was very humble, more than any man on the face of the earth. The next person about whom it can be said, he was the humblest person who walked on the earth is Jesus Christ. But in Moses' day, he was the humblest man that walked on the face of the earth. You see, Moses wrote the first five books of Genesis to Deuteronomy of the Old Testament, but this is put in brackets because Moses didn't write this. Somebody else added it there. 
just by the way, Moses was the humblest man on the face of the earth. Some, God inspired somebody else to add that sentence there. But this man who was the humblest man on the face of the earth at that time, one day when God told him, you know, when the people were asking for water in Numbers chapter 20, and um, the people cried out for water, we, are, we don't have any water to drink, Numbers 20 verse 5. And they went to God and God said to Moses, verse 8, take the rod and speak to the rock. Moses, remember, 40 years ago, in Exodus 17, I told you to hit the rock and the water came out. If I were to paraphrase God's words. But that rock being hit is a picture of Christ being crucified and he does not have to be crucified a second time. So this time when the water, you don't hit it. Because Christ has not got to be crucified a second time. Speak to it. And the water will come. Verse 8, Numbers 20, verse 8. And the water will come. But Moses said, I am the man whom God has blessed. He was proud. See, people fall into sin only when they are proud. Moses took the rod and he lost his temper. And he said in verse 10, you rebels, are we going to bring water out of the rock? What do you mean we? Look at the word. Did you see that word? Shall we? <laughs> As if Moses can bring water out of the rock. It's amazing how we think that just because God used you to bless somebody, you say, we, we are the ones who blessed so and so. Garbage. I want to tell you, my brother, sister, you can bless nobody. Even if you're the most spiritual man on the face of the earth, only God blesses. But this humblest man, Moses, began to think, we, I, am the man who is blessed. It can happen to you. These things are written for our instruction. And instead of speaking to the rock, it says he lifted up his hand, verse 11, and struck the rock not just once but twice. Does God bless disobedience to his word? This is a very big question. Here you see, did the water come out or not? What do you say? Yes. Why? Because God loved those two million people. In spite of the disobedience of his servant, God blessed those people. People ask me the question, women are not supposed to teach God's word. What about all these women who preach on television? Does God bless their word? Here's the answer. She may disobey God's word, but God loves the people and he blesses them. But like God dealt with Moses later on, he will deal with that woman for doing what the Bible tells her not to do. A woman is not called to teach God's word. It's a position of authority. She can testify, she can share her testimony, share what she's received from the God's word, but the moment she begins to teach, she's going into territory God has forbidden. But does God bless such people? Sure. What about all these crooked preachers who are making money from poor people preaching the prosperity gospel, making millions for themselves? Does God bless what they preach? Yes. Here's the proof. Disobedient servants of God are blessed because God loves the people. The 100,000 people sitting there listening to them, are blessed. God loves them. But he'll deal with the servant later on. And all these people who disobey God's word, one day at the judgment seat of Christ, he'll, he'll deal with them when they say, Lord, we did so many things in your name. We preached, we did this. And he said, depart from me. I don't even know you. Here Moses, as soon as he disobeyed, okay, the water came out because God loved the people. But then Moses, the Lord said immediately to Moses, Moses, 40 years. You were waiting, waiting, waiting to enter the promised land. You're punished. You will not enter the promised land. Verse 12. That was the biggest blow. If God had said to him, you'll get leprosy, that would have been much better. He gave him the greatest punishment that he could ever get. You will not enter the promised land. Yeah, that's what happens to humble people when they become proud. They miss out on God's blessing. Now, you know, if... You, later on you read, I don't have time to show you that. It says here in uh, God, do you know that God did bring Moses into the promised land once in Matthew 17 on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? 
It's as if Moses, God said to Moses, listen, I don't forget that you were faithful for 40 years. So even though you punished you there, I'll bring you into the promised land in a better, much better position when my son Jesus is there. God is a good God, I tell you. So merciful, even when he's strict in dealing with us. When, if we have been faithful to live for him, he's merciful. I want to show you another example in the book of Judges. And that's the example of Gideon. You know, Gideon, by the way, I don't know whether you know it, is the first person about whom it's written like this in scripture. The spirit of the Lord came mightily, came upon a person. Where do you read it first time in scripture? Judges 6, 34. The spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he went out with his army of 300 people and destroyed the whole Midianite army. And he became a big man. And the men of Israel, Genesis, sorry, Judges chapter 8, verse 22, when Gideon got this great victory and he was happy to see how God had used him. The men of Israel said, rule over us now, both you and your son. And Gideon takes a very humble position. There are many lessons to learn from the Old Testament. Gideon said, I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. You say, boy, what a humble man. I wish he had stopped there. <laughs> but he didn't stop there. He said, but you can do one thing for me. Give me all your gold. Because I've won this battle for you. So he felt he won the battle. You've got to reward me. Take off all your gold earrings and give it all to me. And it says they, in the next verse 24, and the weight of the gold earrings, verse 26, that he got was 1,700 shekels. Boy, that is tons of gold. He became a billionaire. How did it happen? Pride. He thought, I did this. I'm giving you examples from the Old Testament like that. Now I want to show you one more example. And you know the story of Samson. It's another great example in Judges where I don't have to show you the reference how God used him to do mighty victories with one jawbone of an ass. He drove away so many Philistines and all that. But then he thought, I'm, God is blessing me. I can fool around a little bit with women. Do you know the number of preachers in the last 50 years all over the world who've been mightily used by God when they were humble, but they began to think, yeah, it doesn't matter if I fool around a little bit with women now, watch a little pornography perhaps, or fool around with somebody who's not my wife. Number of preachers, through pride and arrogance, have missed out the blessing of God. It's easy for God to bless a person. It's very difficult for that man to remain humble and to keep on receiving God's blessing. These things are written for our instruction. Okay, now another great example is Samuel. Now you know Samuel was the man when he was a young boy. God gave a message to Eli, the high priest of that time, through Samuel. Listen to this. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10. The Lord came to Samuel and at other times said, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak. And the Lord said, 1 Samuel 3, 11, I'm going to do a thing at which the ears of everyone will tingle. And he said about the, the sin of Eli's children. And God spoke many things, warning Samuel about the way Eli has allowed his two sons to be wayward, I'm going to punish Eli. And God and Samuel told Eli, when Eli came next day to him, what is the word the Lord spoke to you? And verse 18, Samuel told him everything. Now Samuel became a prophet. It's a tremendous thing, you know, if you're a young 10-year-old and you're a prophet, I don't blame Samuel. It must have been very difficult for him in that day. He didn't have the example of Jesus Christ. Not to be proud. 
ten-year-old boy being a prophet and growing up year after year after year and becoming a prophet. But Samuel grew older and you know what he did? This is another danger. Even Samuel blundered. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 1. He had two sons <clears throat> and he appointed his two sons as judges. Why did he do that? He didn't see God about it. He thought I was blessed. So what I do God will bless. No. Just because you've been blessed doesn't mean God will bless anything you do. He appointed his two sons and listen to this. Verse 3. His two sons did not walk in his ways. They took bribes and they cheated people. They perverted justice, took bribes from criminals and set them free. And the elders, the news went round. Samuel's sons are wayward. Whose, are this? Whose sons are these? The same man who had warned Eli about his sons. I've come across cases like this of preachers who have warned other people about something. They themselves go and do the same thing. People, they warned about some other people's children and they themselves, their own children are going straight. Be very careful before you go around criticizing other people's children. Be very careful when you go around criticizing other people's children. See what happened to Samuel. Leave them to God. If you want to do something, pray for them. There's a great danger of some people sitting here who look at the waywardness of the child of somebody else in this church and you speak against it because you brought up your children so well, oh ho. Beware of the same thing that happened to Samuel can happen to you. He became proud and his two sons went astray till the whole elders of Israel came to know about it and said, Samuel, your sons are not walking in your ways. They are wicked. Another example from the Old Testament to warn us. Let me give you one more example from the Old Testament and that is Saul. We read this in 1 Samuel in chapter 10. When Samuel's sons failed, they said, give us a king. We don't want any more of these judges. So God said, okay, let them have a king. They have rejected me as king. Let them have their own king. And they took lots. There were 12 tribes. They took lots. Then different, different families. And they took lots. Because they believed in the Old Testament. That if you take a lot, throw the, throw the lot. And ultimately, God will pick out the right person. And they threw the lots for the whole tribe of Israel. And they picked out one man's name. Saul. Who was the son of Kish. From the tribe of Benjamin. In 1 Samuel 10. They looked for Saul. Hey, verse 21. Middle of verse 21, Saul was chosen, and listen to this. They announced the name, Saul, son of Kish, has been chosen as king. Come forward. And in this crowd of people, and it says he could not be found. Can you imagine what a humble man he was? 1 Samuel 10, 21, hey, hey, I don't want to be king. I'm just an ordinary person. I can't do this. And it says in verse 22, he was hiding inside some baggage. Some people's luggage was there. He was hiding under the suitcases. Can you imagine? The man who was chosen to be king, he didn't want to be king and he was hiding himself. I mean, so different from today when people say, if you want, I want to make you a ruler or an elder, they, oh, they rush forward. Sure, of course, I think I'm worthy for it. They wanted to make Jesus king and he ran away. Saul was like that. But the same Saul, one day, disobeyed God and we read also that he offered up the sacrifice as if he was a priest you know in the olden days the king's job was one the priest's job was another a king could never be a priest and a priest could never be a king and there was a reason for it the first king priest was to be Jesus Christ nobody else and the Lord says that you are a king uh, after the order of Melchizedek a king and a priest but in the nation of Israel, Melchizedek was outside Israel. In the nation of Israel, nobody was allowed to be a king and a priest. That was reserved for Christ. But Samuel, uh, but uh, Saul, we read in 1 Samuel 15, he went and 
offered the sacrifice. I'm sorry, it's 1 Samuel 13. He offered the sacrifice when God told him not to do it. And Samuel came just in time after that and said, why have you done this? You've committed a terrible sin in doing this. This is the same man who once upon a time did not even want to be a king. But here we read that 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 11, Samuel said, what have you done? You're not supposed to offer the peace offering. It says in verse 9, Saul offered it. And the Lord said, and Samuel said to Saul, because you have done this, the Lord has taken away, verse 13, the kingdom from you. Verse 14, your kingdom will not endure. You were called to be a king and you tried to be a priest as well. The same man who did not want to be a king. It's easy for God to bless someone. Difficult for them to remain humble once they are blessed. Okay, here's another example in David. You know how David was so blessed when he was looking after the sheep in the wilderness and running off from Saul, cave to cave. He was writing psalms. He was writing scripture those days. Many of the psalms that David wrote were written before he was 30 years old, before he became king, when he was strumming the guitar and looking after the sheep, when he was running from cave to cave, escaping from Saul. He wrote psalms inspired by God. But once he became king, this man who was so blessed by God, see what happened to him. 2 Sam, Samuel chapter 11. One time when the kings go to battle, in those days, when an army went to battle, the person in front of the battle was the king. He was the leader. He was the general of the army. And it says here in 2 Samuel 11 verse 1, when kings go to battle, David should have gone. But he said, well, I'm a big man now. I don't have to go for these battles and all. Let somebody else go. And he stayed at Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 11 verse 1. You know what happened? In the evening, he got up from his bed. <laughs> He's sleeping. Lazy. He should have been praying for his army. The best thing to do when you get up from bed is to pray. Before you do anything else. Even before you get out of bed. Pray. David just got up from bed. Big man. I'm the man who has written scripture. I'm the man who killed Goliath. Tore a lion to pieces. I'm the man of God. And he walks on the roof and he looks out to the other across the wall and he sees a woman bathing. What should he have done? He should have immediately turned around and gone back to his room. But no. He keeps staring. And he's tempted. And you know, till today, people talk about David and Bathsheba. All because he did not go to battle when he should have gone. He did not go to the prayer meeting. He was too lazy, slept. And when he got up from bed, he didn't pray. He said, oh, I'm okay, I'm a big man. And the calamity that came. It's happened to many, many people after that. He was proud and he lost the grace, the grace of God upon him. And the last example I want to give is, of course, Judas Iscariot. It says in Luke chapter 6, see the context in which it comes. Luke 6. This is the one time in the Bible where it says Jesus went and prayed all night. And he prayed all night for one reason, because he wanted to select the right 12 people to be his apostles. He had 70, he had others, but he says, among these 70, who's the one I'm to choose? And it says here, he went out to pray a whole night, verse 12. And what was he praying? Father, show me who should be the 12, who should be the 12. Who should be the ones I have to select to be the leaders of my church? This is not a sudden decision. Small decisions you can pray over two, three minutes and take a decision. But this is a major decision that's going to affect the world for the next 2,000 years. Major decisions you have to pray longer. 
He prayed all night. And when the day came, he had it clear in his mind. The father told him, verse 14, Simon, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Simon, Judas, and Judas Iscariot, verse 16, who became a traitor. He was not a traitor then. When it, some, when it says somebody became a leper, it doesn't mean he was always a leper. When it says he became a traitor, it means he was not always a traitor. He was selected to be an apostle. I believe that he could have written the epistles that Paul wrote. Because Judas Iscariot was the cleverest of all the disciples. He was a postgraduate. But he missed the crown. You know that verse in Revelation chapter 3 which says, Hold on to your crown, let somebody else take it. In Revelation 3. Judas Iscariot was to be given a crown, but Paul got it. Paul got his crown and Judas's crown as well. And Judas Iscariot, now this is before he became a traitor, he's selected, and can you imagine, out of all these disciples standing out, Jesus calling out names. And Judas, his name is called, wow, I'm one of the chosen. And that went to his head. And he became a tra traitor. He didn't go to the head of the others. What are these things written for? These things are written for our instruction. Let's turn back to the verse I read in 1 Corinthians 10. These things happened as an example for us. Remember this. That's why three quarters of the Bible is the Old Testament. These things have happened as an example for you and me. God may bless you mightily, like all these people, but see what happened finally. They were confident in themselves. The failure of all of them was they began to have self-confidence, and I believe that is the danger that can happen to us when God has blessed us. It's a thing that has happened to many, many groups through the years that God has blessed us and he'll always continue to bless us. God has blessed CFC for 45 years, he will continue to bless us. Not necessarily, my brother, sister. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Don't look down on other denominations. Don't say like the Pharisee, Lord, we thank you, we are not like the other churches. We understand the new covenant, Lord. God, have mercy on us if we ever come to that place. But, there are individuals sitting here and there in our CFC churches who think like that. And that's why the grace of God is not upon them or upon their children. If it goes well with you, give the glory to God. If it goes well with your children, please listen. Don't ever, ever, ever compare your children with other people's children. That is how your children will get ruined. And some of you have ruined your children. Because you have secretly boasted about them as if they are better than others. Where are they today? You've encouraged them to be proud that they are better than others and superior to others spiritually. And where are they now? Don't blame them. Oh, brother, they are going astray. You led them astray because you were proud of them and filled their heads with pride thinking, making them think they are better than others. We have a tremendous responsibility as fathers and mothers. Don't blame others. Take the blame yourself. Say, Lord, I failed. These things are written. Remember what happened to Samuel? Classic example. Oh, Eli's children are like that. Uh huh. Samuel, just wait till your children grow up. Let's see what happens. These things are written as an example for us. Families, churches, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I've come across so many different Christian groups in my life. I've come across very fine preachers and different ones, but I tell you, I have seen very, very few people in my entire life who have consistently and heard of very, very few people who have endured until the end in humility. Who never say, 
Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you that my children are not like other people's children. I thank you that my church is not like other people's church. I thank you that we have understood all things better than other churches. Very few people. It's amazing how pride comes in. So people have asked me this question through the years. Brother Zach, what is the secret of remaining in humility? Always. Very simple. If you walk with a humble man, you'll be humble. And the humblest man that walked on the earth was Jesus Christ. Walk with him every day. When you begin a day, this is how I begin my day. And I, before I get out of bed, <clears throat> the first person I talk to is Jesus Christ. First person. Lord Jesus, I want to walk with you today. I don't want to be a great preacher. I don't want to do any great things for you. I just want to walk with you in humility, in brokenness, in purity over sin, in my thought life, in my conversation, that I never get angry, never, get, never murmur or complain about anything. In my relationship with my wife, who's the one I see every day, Lord, please preserve me. I'm a weak person. I'm the chief of all the sinners, but I know you can keep me in, with the grace of God upon my life till the end of my days. I want to encourage you, walk with Jesus. Walk with him every day. It's the greatest honor we can have. The king of kings that I can walk with him. You will never, never become proud of anything in your life. And the grace of God will be upon you till the end of your days. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads in prayer, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Please remember and meditate on what we heard or listen to the tape again later. Listen to it often so that you're reminded of the failures of other people. Learn from the failures of others and never, never say it will not happen to me. Lord have mercy on us. We are in great danger. The devil is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking to devour people with pride. And yet in the midst of all, we hear your word saying, Come, learn from me, for I am humble of heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. We want to learn from you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we want to see your example in the little things we read in the Gospels and walk that way till the end of our life. We thank you for your mercy upon us. We thank you that your mercy has preserved us and our children and our families and everything else. We give you all the glory, Heavenly Father, for being such a loving Father to us, warning us in advance of dangers we will face. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.